I suppose in, this is the point in this discussion uh, to point out that there, this visible language that I'm talking about, there is a precedent for it in nature. Uh, there's a very interesting book, which if you're into animal communication, it's well worth reading. It's called uh, Communication and Non-Communication uh, Among the Cephalopods. And it points out that octopi uh, have this ability to change their color and their shape and their surface texture. And it was at first assumed that this had to do with camouflage against complex backgrounds. But it turns out that it has nothing to do with that or very little to do with that, that octopi communicate visually. And so, in a sense, the octopus is the model for the kind of future evolution of human communications that I'm suggesting we need. The octopus is, from the point of view of another octopus, uh, a naked mind, an entirely naked mind, because it does not transduce its thoughts into acoustical waves which move across space and are then reconstructed in a culturally sanctioned dictionary. It actually becomes its meaning. It translates syntax into three dimensions, and it dances its intent. And the soft body of these creatures allows them to fold and unfold and reveal and hide parts of themselves very rapidly. As fast as we can make speech, they do this. And so th this is a potential model for how human beings might communicate. After all, if we were simply naked minds, I imagine us as existing as somewhat filamentatious creatures in a semi-aqueous cybernetic medium with us displaying our syntactical uh, intent on our surface. You would become what you mean in that case. And the octopus does that. The reason octopi extrude ink into the water is so that they can form a private thought. It's the only way that they're able to disconnect from the telepathic net. Well, the question is, what about the way ayahuasca is being done in America without ikaros and ritual? I've never sat in on an American ayahuasca session. I know they occur in several different styles. The thing about ayahuasca that you have to be aware of that is both a strength and a weakness of it is that unlike mushrooms or peyote or iboga or morning glory seeds or datura, it is a drug in the sense that it's combined of two ingredients and made by somebody. Nobody makes peyote. Nobody makes mushrooms. But somebody makes ayahuasca. And, and it's like uh, flan or something. It can be made badly or it can be made well. So the first issue is how was it made? And the style of these more public ayahuasca circles is to make it mild. They don't want people swinging from the chandeliers. It, ayahuasca can range over a spectrum from what's all the excitement about to, you know, hang on Hannah. <laughs> the, and, and so, you know, it takes a bit of fiddling uh, uh, to get it right. It shouldn't exist. It, it's impossible. And every time I do it, I come down and I say, this is impossible. I mean, to call that a drug? What a joke. I mean, it just masquerades as a drug. It's not a drug. That's preposterous. Uh, the problem with DMT is its incredible power. That only the most intrepid can form any coherent impression whatsoever of what's going on if it's a strong trip. I mean, there are sub-threshold trips where you just graze the tummy of the beast and then people come down with various models of 
archetypal closure with the cosmic carnival. That's the archetype of DMT, is the cosmic circus. And, and, but once you, if you actually get a strong hit of it, which is in no way dangerous, but simply a true boundary dissolving hit, it's into some place, it's almost like, well, I once said, you know, the, there's danger of death by astonishment. <laughs> and, and I think that's true. That's the major danger is death by astonishment. Because you just get in there and you say, my God, you know, I thought I had some expectation of what was possible and instead this is just so blown that and it re- it somewhat freaks me out i have to confess it's it is so alien so huge so complete in itself so unrelated to our petty concerns on this planet i mean i went to it first as an art historian and the, and i was a jungian I mean, I, you know, I had Jungian proclivities and, and I thought, you know, w- what does this say about the archetypes? There is no archetype for this. Not in the painting of the Bushman, not in the ecstasies of Hildegard von Bingen, not in the ravings of Mandayan ecstatics. Human spiritual experience never got this deep, never tore open this doorway. And yet what? It's a long toke away for an ordinary human being. How could something that (laughs) titanic and beautiful and cosmic and alien be kept secret when what we do is we seek in all corners, in all times and places, for the bizarre, the outre, the unthinkable. We're always turning over rocks, secret teachings, you know, ancient cities, buried ruins, lost tribes, you name it. Well then, here is this thing which is like the absolute quintessence of what all those things are, are aiming for. You know, more stunning than the rise of Atlantis from the Atlantic seaboard is a toke of DM. MT, more appalling than the, arise, the arrival of alien star fleets in the skies of our planet. And yet, it's here. It's here. And I don't often invoke it. I mean, for me to talk about it is to invoke it because it's weird to talk about it because it reminds me that we don't know what we're doing at all, that we sit in rooms discussing all this stuff and, and, you know, a war rages, ignorant armies clash by night, that whole thing. But, you know, this extraordinarily powerful thing, the depth of which, the measure of which is so hard to take, lies very near. What I had hoped from, what I had hoped for from ayahuasca was... Uh, my brother and I, when we got into this DMT stuff, we said, we've got to slow down this movie. I mean, you get in there for about 70 seconds, the first 35 of which is taken up with you checking all your meters to make sure you're not dead. <laughs> because that's that's what you assume, you know. You, ass- you say, I did it, I'm dead, I'm fuck it, I'm dead. <laughs> and And then you say, but, you know, chest rising and falling, (laughs) thoughts continuing in linear progression. Apparently, I'm not dead. (laughs) Apparently, I'm something else. Well, then, by the time you sort it out, you're usually coming down. And people come down babbling, raving. I mean, I've seen, you know, people who've headed mega corporations, people who are accustomed to uh, ordering hundreds of people around, just completely... Uh, come apart because it is so unexpected. So our notion was slow the movie down, get in there. And uh, uh, ayahuasca looks like a strategy for doing that. And we couldn't imagine, you know, can you picture people wearing penis sheaths and painting themselves with red ochre and they have this and this is what they're doing and and then it makes the whole notion of history seem crazy i mean i mean we're primitives because we way diddle around with atom smashers and stealth bombers and stuff like that i mean you know and these people have this other thing so of course they don't wear clothes bill would you, you know? 
and uh, largely, I would say, uh, what we've learned from 20, 25 years of dealing with this is that our strategy was right. Ayahuasca will let you in to these places, and so will psilocybin. What I've decided, based on experience, is that uh, what I'm interested in is a very tiny subset of all the smorgasbord of possible altered states and experiences that life and nature offer up, that there are many altered states, detura, ketamine, MDMA, uh, endlessly, and then, you know, uh, states brought on by ordeal and uh, and fasting and meditation. I, I am only interested as a phenomenologist, definitely more with the attitude of the scientist than some kind of conclusion drawer. I'm interested in this very circumscribed area in organic nature because it's not supposed to be there, folks. It's like a a little... a a doorway into the previous universe or something. The whole, you know, in the... in at the height of Islam in the 10th century, the poets of the Mughal dynasty said of the city of Isfahan in, in Iran because of its mosques and architecture, that it was half the world. The Isfahan is half the world. DMT is half the world. The shiny, bright, active, uh, exfoliating and bizarre part. Well then, we then are poised in this strange dimension of diminished possibility. Where are we? What is that? What is it to possess a body such that you can use it as an instrument to turn on and off these places? How does it reflect on the quest for understanding of the here and now? How does it uh, reflect on the quest for, uh, uh, I don't know, immortality or or enlightenment or uh, a a sense of fitting in to the cosmic purpose? I don't know. I mean, one can play a reductionist game and say that the human brain-mind system is an alarm clock, DMT is a hammer, hit the alarm clock with the hammer and you learn all about gears <laughs> because they spring out and become visible. But uh, And this is how science works. This is the scientific method. Smash it. <laughs> Then count the pieces. Find the bigger pieces. Find the littlest pieces. Smash them. Count the pieces. Find the little pieces. Smash them. That's how it proceeds. Well, obviously, that's not going to take us too far in this domain because it's entirely made up of structure, of connection, of relationship, of uh, thought. And... uh, Because I'm concerned about the planet and the predicament we're in and the way we spend our resources and cheat our children of a sane future and all that, I keep trying to reconnect this back into the human world. But I frankly don't know whether that can be done. Another area I work in is I try to connect it up to the perennial philosophies of of humanity, Zen and Buddhism and shaman. I don't know whether that can be done. The shamans that I have gotten really close to have not been, I would not call, they were able to cure people, but they had no pretension of spiritual accomplishment. They weren't even interested in that. They were interested in what they would call understanding the same thing which drives a scientist they say I, I mean Don Fidel who I took most of my ayahuasca with we would take it on Saturday nights with a group of about 40 people and cure and then we would take it on Wednesday nights just he and I or a couple of other people and that was for learning he always said and he said you can't cure unless you learn and I felt very comfortable with these people because it, it from the outside it looks like ritual and taboo and power and from the inside it's just hey let's all cook something up and try to figure it out 
it was totally familiar to me from my days in Berkeley in the 60s. It's the head ethic. It's cook it up, try it out, try and make sense of it with your friends. 